We have a great pleasure to have Rob Myers. He will tell us about quantum extre extreme of iron made easy. Okay, please, uh, 45 minutes. Okay, very good. So I wanted to uh, thank our hosts in Moscow for inviting me to speak here, but I also wanted to commend them for uh, carrying on in these challenging times and bringing us all together in this virtual forum. I think this is a, a great idea. Um, before I uh, start my talk, or, or as I start my talk, I wanted to be sure that I mentioned that the, it's uh, not just my work, but it involves uh, these four smart people at the bottom here. There's uh, uh, Josh Sandor, Vincent Chen, and Ignacio uh, Reyes, as well as Dominic uh, Neumanfeld. Um, I should also mention, uh, there it is, there it is, uh, that this is a work in progress, um, but I'm hoping that a paper will appear in the, in the near future. In any event, the, the topic's a topic that we've heard about many times this week already, and in fact, in the previous talk, um, the question uh, is trying to understand or better understand the black hole information paradox. And this was the observation that, that Hawking made a long time ago that, you know, in a gravitational collapse, one might be able to, one might start with a pure quantum mechanical state, um, but through the, the evaporation process, the emission of the Hawking radiation, the black hole disappears and appears to leave us with a thermal state of uh, Hawking radiation, which uh, we describe as a mixed state. Um, and so there's a tension there with the basic uh, tenets of uh, quantum mechanics or unitary time evolution. Um, as we've seen, uh, an interesting way to describe the uh, issue is using uh, entropy as a diagnostic. And so here I'm just drawing the naive curve that one finds for the entropy of the radiation as it uh, goes off to infinity. And so there's little radiation to begin with and the, the uh, entropy starts low. But then as the, the evaporation process carries on, it just increases and increases until the black hole is completely evaporated. And at that point, there's no more radiation. And so uh, the entropy is saturated. However, as Hong described very nicely in the previous talk, um, Don Page looked at this question um, and argued that uh, in the case uh, or for consistency with unitary time evolution said that in fact, uh, at, at about the midpoint of the evaporation process, the entropy and the radiation should start to decrease again. Um, and so there should be this characteristic curve of rising to a peak and then uh, falling again to zero. Uh, once the black hole has disappeared, all of the information should be in the uh, uh, final state, and, and so there should be no, that should again be a pure state, and there should be no entropy. And so that's a, been a puzzle for a long time, uh, but we've seen uh, new insights coming from holography and holograph holographic entanglement entropy, in particular, these uh, two papers last spring really kicked off these investigations. Um, but I'll also be making reference to this important uh, paper that came out in uh, August. Uh, but I have to say that there have been a number of contrib well, there's been a whole host of contributions now, and you, we heard uh, about many of them uh, over the course of the week. Um, but I just, uh, I'm going to focus on these first three papers and uh, tell you about an extension uh, that our work uh, is just, so if we focus on the second uh, paper, this is something that Netta already described uh, on Monday a little bit. Um, so basically they were talking about a very simple system where I have uh, two quantum mechanical systems on the left and the right here. And uh, one of them is coupled or has the potential to be coupled to a bath, which means that it's just a uh, ordinary, uh, two-dimensional CFT filling a half line. 
Um, and although I'm saying the word bath here it really is just a vacuum state, it's a reservoir of a large number of degrees of freedom that uh, in, a, in a moment we'll talk about connecting uh, the quantum mechanical system to this bath and so energy can leak out into that reservoir. These quantum mechanical systems though are holographic and can alternately be described by some uh, two-dimensional anti-de-sitter space, um, which supports uh, something known as JP gravity, um, but it also supports more matter fields. And in particular, there's another copy of uh, these CFP degrees of freedom that live in this gravitational region or in this holographic description over here as well. Now, the key trick, um, that uh, Netta described is that initially uh, one begins with uh, the two quantum mechanical systems in a thermofield double state so that holographically we have some kind of black hole here and they're decoupled from the bath but one changes boundary conditions or introduces a coupling between the bath and the quantum mechanics at a certain point and so radiation starts to leak out into the bath and when one considers quantum extremal surfaces, um, what one finds is that, uh, in fact, one can reproduce the page curve. Now, I'll comment on a few technical details there because they're going to be important later on. Although I'm saying there's a black hole in this uh, JP gravity, uh, we should keep in mind that, in fact, the geometry here is just two-dimensional anti-de-sitter space. And that comes from the form, uh, well, it's very straightforward to see from the, the gravitational action in JP gravity or Jacuzzi total volume gravity. Um, one has to uh, introduce a second field, the dilaton here, which is important because by itself, the Einstein term is just topological in two dimensions. And so the interesting dynamic comes from this scalar field, but integrating out this field, the equation of motion just sets the curvature equal to a constant. And so the geometry locally looks like simply anti de Sitter space everywhere. Of course, the dilaton has an interesting profile in this uh, background. Now, if we think about holography and holographic entanglement entropy, a boundary slice, time slice is just a point over here on the edge of my diagram. And again, an RT surface is simply a point somewhere down here in the bulk. And what we're told uh, in higher dimensions to do is to extremize the area or the gravitational entropy. Here, what I'm extremizing is the coefficient of the new, uh, or the coefficient that appears in front of the Ricci scalar in the action. And so it's really finding a, an extremal value for this dilaton field, which in this solution turns out to be right here at the bifurcation surface of uh, this particular coordinate system. And so that would be the RT surface. However, what we were instructed to do was think about quantum extremal surfaces. And so in that case, we're not just evaluating this quantity at our candidate point, we're also taking into account the matter contributions to the entanglement entropy on a time slice that runs from the point out to infinity to our boundary time slice here. Now I've shown a couple of potential uh, Cauchy slices or time slices here on which I could evaluate that entanglement entropy. But because of unitary time evolution, I can, it doesn't matter which choice I make there, I'm going to get the same contribution coming from the matter field. On the other hand, if I move my point around, I'm changing both this gravitational contribution and I'm changing uh, the uh, entanglement or the contribution coming from the uh, matter field. And so the rule is that in this, uh, these calculations, I'm supposed to take into account both of those contributions when I'm extremizing to find uh, the entanglement entropy uh, with our RT, well, our generalized RT formula. 
Now, uh, given that result or given that approach, in fact, one finds some nice uh, page curve uh, here. There's a, there's a time in which the entropy is growing as the evaporation starts. And then there's a time uh, we, we switch to a new class of extremal surfaces. And there's a time when the entropy decreases again. Um, and so we, these simple models recover something that looks very much like the page curve. Now, what happened in the uh, August paper here, this third paper, was an interesting generalization. As I spoke about this CFP so far, it can be any uh, two-dimensional CFP. But in this paper, the suggestion was, well, let's consider a particular class of CFPs where, which are actually holographic. And in that case, there's a third description of this same system in which I would replace the CFP uh, on the half line here by a three-dimensional uh, anti-de-sitter space. And similarly, below this gravitational region, there would also be uh, an ADS3 region. And the full description now involves you know, various other uh, entities, an end of the world brain here, a Planck brain. But again, those are just uh, details and we'll see how they appear in, in, a, in a different setting in a, in a moment. But the key idea is now that I have three different descriptions of the same system. Uh, the initial system where I just have quantum mechanics and a CFP, I've introduced gravity here using the holography of the two quantum mechanical systems. But then I have another layer of holography here by working with a special class of two dimensional CFPs. And in that case, the same uh, page curve now has bulk descriptions in terms of RT surfaces. Uh, and each one of these different uh, phases in the evolution of the entropy actually in, uh, is a different class of bulk surfaces in the three-dimensional ADS space. Now that's a, a, a very beautiful result, um, but it raises a number of different questions. You know, this is a very simple two-dimensional model. One might ask if that was important. One might ask questions, you know, is this uh, boundary here, should I think of this Planck brain as part of the uh, the boundary or the bulk degrees of freedom? Was it important that I use JT gravity here on the brain? Um, how was the information encoded in the Hawking radiation that leaked out? And in case I run out of time, which I expect to, here are some answers. Um, but really, um, what I what the message of my talk today is, is that many of these new insights that we uh, see um, are really can be understood in terms of familiar properties and behaviors that we've already encountered in holographic entanglement entropy. And I don't want to diminish the, uh, the value of the new insights, but I just, I want to put it in a framework where perhaps we can uh, go further with it and gain uh, a better understanding of these new results. So I'm actually uh, going to think about this problem in the context of higher dimensions. I want to get away from these two-dimensional gravity theories. And so I'm going to actually uh, go back uh, 20 years to a scenario that was uh, very popular at the beginning of the 2000s of brain world constructions or Randall Sundrum gravity. And so in particular, I'm going to think about a, a D plus one dimensional gravity, but I'm going to stick into that system a uh, co-dimension one brain. That co-dimension one brain is going to back react uh, on the system as we'll see in a moment. I might add that you can also add a gravitational uh, interaction on the brain. Now it falls into a class of theories known as DGP but that's really not gonna be relevant for any of the discussion that I have today. And so we'll just focus on the, the results for this particular system. Um, if you integrate out the bulk, uh, 
what you find is a gravitational theory on the brain. In fact, there are new modes in the bulk theory, and in particular, there's a massless graviton that's localized in the vicinity of the brain, and the effective action or the induced action for that graviton takes this form here. There's a cosmological constant term and the, the parameter L effective, which is going to become the uh, scale of curvature in the bulk or uh, on this in this gravity theory is given by this expression here involving the bulk ADS scale, the tension of the brain, and the Newton's constant in the bulk. And then there's a uh, ordinary Einstein-Hilbert term, and then there's a whole series of uh, higher curvature terms. And the one thing we're going to do is we're going to tune the tension of the brain so that this quantity or one over L is actually very small, um, much smaller than one over the ADS scale in the original bulk theory. And as a result of that, or, or that choice, the re reason we're doing it is to suppress all of these higher curvature terms here. These terms are now going to be suppressed by the ratio of the bulk ADS scale over the brain or the effective ADS scale in this induced action. And so for the most part, I can think of my theory as just Einstein gravity coupled to a particular uh, uh, value of the cosmological constant. Now, what is the, the, the full solution? Well, we can uh, find that very simply uh, in the following way. What I have here is a um, cross-section of a D plus one dimensional ADS. That's the vacuum solution of my original gravity theory. Uh, but what I've done here is I've parameterized that um, in, or I've uh, foliated that ADS with a bunch uh, in a particular way where the, the surfaces that I'm folding weighting with are actually anti de Sitter space in one lower dimension. Now, what I'm going to, whoops, there it is. There we go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut off uh, the geometry on one of those surfaces at some large value of rho here or some value so that this we don't go all the way out to infinity. Um, then what I'm going to do is introduce a second copy of that space, and I'm going to glue them together on this cut uh, surface here by looking at the, well, I apply the Israel junction conditions. I look at the jump in the extrinsic curvature, and that has to be related to the tension of the brain that we introduce. And in that way, I find uh, what the location of the brain is here. And so my full solution looks like ADS over here and ADS over here, but there's a jump uh, between the two halves of the space uh, that's represented or created by the tension pull brain along the green line here. An alternative way actually to solve for that position though is that one could just solve the gravitational equations of motion in my induced action. Um, and that would uh, give me uh, a curvature scale for an ADS space. And I could just look at uh, my metric here, and I could see where exactly I'm supposed to position the brain, given that solution of the equations of motion, to reproduce the desired curvature. So that's just holography in action. I could either use this bulk approach of Israel junction conditions, or I could use this uh, brain approach of solving the gravitational equations of motion. One uh, side note is that uh, it's a lot more work to draw pictures like this, and so I'm going to draw simpler pictures that might look like this. The, this is the cross-section of ADS, and I've got a green line representing the brain, but what you should remember is there's a lot of back reaction and there's a lot of extra geometry hidden in the vicinity of the green line when I draw a simple picture like that. A remark in passing is that if I have an RT surface that stretches across, say from this point on the boundary over to here, and so it crosses uh, the brain, 
then the leading contribution of that bulk area actually includes a term which is just equivalent to the expected gravitational entropy from this action. In particular, I'd find the area or the cross-section of the RT surface on the brain divided by that Newton's constant, which is given by this formula here. So now uh, I actually have, oh, sorry, yeah, what's the question? Uh, just a question, just to contrast it with the lower dimensional case to make sure I understood your construction. So you have the bulk on both sides of the brain. Yes, I do. And that's right. Uh, and that, that's different. That, ah, okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and I, uh, yeah. Okay. We'll just carry on. Sorry, Robert, uh, yes. related question. Uh, so yeah. that means you do not have Randall syndrome boundary conditions on the brain. Why not? Uh, because in that case, it means you have only one side of the brain because the other side you impose. Uh, I think we're getting into semantics then. Uh, there are, you know, there were lots of constructions. Um, the construction I would like to advocate for is one where the brain is in the middle of the space and there's ADS tailing away on either side. But then you have two interiors on both sides, right? That's right, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, okay. So, so I should say the word two in a moment. Um, but I have uh, the usual holographic description where there's a boundary description. And what that involves is a D-dimensional CFP. And I'm, uh, I'm envisioning it here to live on a, a time slice, which is a D minus one sphere. However, what we've done by introducing the brain is uh, introducing a conformal D, sorry, I'm waving my hand. I, I, I'm, I'm introducing a conformal defect um, uh, into the, the boundary system. And I've, the choice I made is to put that conformal defect to run around the equator of this sphere. And so it's actually an SD minus two. Um, the, uh, that's the geometry of my conformal defect. Alternatively, I can go down to the bottom and where I have the bulk description, where I have my, that's the description I essentially described before, where I have D plus one dimensional ADS space. Um, and that's coupled to this brain and the brain back reacts, but it's in a very symmetric configuration. So that the, the geometry of the brain is a, an, a, a D dimensional ADS. But as has been emphasized, uh, the brain isn't the end of something. It's just sitting there in the middle of the space, and I've got two copies or, or two large ADS regions on either side. Um, I can also go to this halfway house here where I think of the holographic CFP living on my sphere, but I can think uh, in a certain regime that I am uh, doing Randall syndrome gravity with the brain. And so there I actually have gravity in this ADS uh, D, but it's actually supporting, and this is the two, two copies of a D-dimensional CFP. And it's the same CFP as appears in the boundary, but the reason, as Ilias pointed out, uh, the reason there are two copies of that CFP is there are actually two sides to the brain. And so there are bulk modes associated, well, th there are just two copies in the appropriate regime. They're weakly coupled um, copies. But I should also emphasize that, you know, according to, well, as we know from the standard Rundle syndrome scenario, this is an effective description that's useful up to some cutoff scale. This isn't a fundamental description of this system here. Um, I promised you, or I talked about page curves. In fact, uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do the, in what in my case is a simpler scenario. And we've heard about it a number of times already this week, but we're gonna think about thermal equilibrium. Um, so what am I doing there? Well, I'm, I'm really just co constructing uh, a hartle hawking state. And this is something that was discussed by these three authors. Um, in the fall uh, last year, and there's related work uh, that Mark Van Ransdonk and collaborators out at UBC 
uh, put out at a, a, well, essentially the same time. Uh, but if I want the hiatal Hawking state, I'm going to use a Euclidean path integral. And what I'm going to do is think about some simple Euclidean uh, geometries first. Uh, in the gravity system, I've got a uh, Saccar-like uh, geometry here where I have an asymptotic circle, but that circle shrinks to a point at the place where we thought, or there would be a horizon in the Lorentzian geometry. Um, I want to couple that to my uh, bath system or my two-dimensional CFD. To put that into a uh, thermal state, we simply do a path integral on a thermal cylinder. And so in this purple region here, though, there's no gravity. That's only here in this. The fact that the circles match up in my picture is to indicate that the temperature of the CFT over here is the same as the Hawking temperature uh, at the surface where they're coupled uh, in the gravitational system. Uh, now, what one does is given this instanton, you can think about slicing it in half. And then what you've done on that dotted line is essentially you've prepared the Hartle Hawking state, uh, which you can evolve forward in Lorentzian time. Um, and so this is just squashing out that instanton that I had before in the lower half of the picture. This is my hartle hawking state that I've prepared. And then this is the time evolution of that state. And what I find in the gravitational region is my uh, black hole with the two horizons. And then I get ordinary flat space. Although now uh, in these regions, it's uh, supporting a thermal bath of the CFT. And we can forget about where it came from and just think about the Euclidean solution, which is going to be most useful uh, moving forward. Um, but given that system, I, I said that it's in thermal equilibrium. And so one might think that there's no information paradox. And so that's somewhat of a puzzle. However, these folks pointed out that, in fact, there is a puzzle because um, the two systems are continuously exchanging radiation. And so, for example, I might have an entangled pair of uh, uh, quanta, which on this side, the quanta wanders off to infinity or just lives in the uh, bath system. But on this side, it wanders off or, or it falls into uh, the gravitational region and then is absorbed by the black hole. And so a process like that would increase the entanglement entropy between the bath and the gravitational region. Similarly, you can go the other way. One might think of two quanta that are entangled in the gravitational region, one of which falls in the black hole, but the other one which escapes out into the bath uh, over here. Again, that's a process that's going to increase the entanglement entropy. Oops, sorry. And so if one looks at uh, what uh, the radiation of the bath or the increase in the radiation of the bath, there's a delta here, uh, would be you would get some essentially linear growth um, that just uh, in this case continues forever. However, you know, the black hole should only be able to store a finite amount of information. And so the, the page curve should actually uh, saturate at certain points, and there should be um, just it, the entropy should just flatten off and be constant uh, after we reach a certain point. So, how is that seen in these uh, gravitational calculations? Well, what these folks up here showed us is that this early phase. Um, what one sees is the usual uh, or or a typical uh, configuration where one has the, the bath, uh, where I'm considering both sides of the eternal black hole, and there's some kind of root Akinagi surface that connects the, the two boundaries um, in a holographic setup. But in this uh, phase here, which we'll call the page phase, we make a transition to a new class of surfaces. And what happens is that there's an island uh, or a region here near the black hole horizon. It's also included and it becomes a part of uh, the entanglement wedge. And so that is 
uh, you know, the Aquanum Extremal Island of the title of my talk. And so these new uh, surfaces appear. And there's, uh, uh, it seems then that the bath encodes uh, eventually information about the interior of the black hole. Another point that the, was a surprise uh, perhaps in this paper is that these quantum extremal surfaces are actually outside of uh, the, the black hole horizon. And so what I would like to do is I would like to give a setup where we can see all of that, uh, but now in higher dimensions. Uh, remember what I had was uh, this Randall Sundrum scenario, but even though the bulk geometry, if I just go back to the vacuum of the bulk gravity theory, uh, I'm thinking of it being global ADS, but I can choose a coordinate system where it actually appears to be a hyperbolic black hole. And so this is what we typically call the uh, ADS Rindler coordinate. And so there, as I've drawn in my picture here, there's, uh, there are these horizons um, where GTT in this particular frame uh, vanishes. Um, and if I think about the asymptotic geometry, what I've got though in this uh, case is a hyperbolic space for the, the time slices and then I've got time. And so what this is describing is the thermophile double state for our boundary CFD, not in flat space or not on the original uh, cylinder, but on this geometry R for time cross this hyperbolic geometry. And ADS has a very particular temperature um, that's governed by this parameter here for the radius of curvature of my hyperbolic space um, as so. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take that realization of ADS space and I'm going to stick my brain through the middle of it. And so now what I'm describing is not just uh, this boundary CF uh, thermo uh, thermophile double state up here. Now I've also got the, uh, I've also engaged the conformal defect uh, in this uh, thermophile double. And so I've got essentially the same geometry, but I've got uh, a brain now in the bulk. And so that's again, introducing the conformal defect in the boundary theory. But essentially the previous discussion that I had that went th with this picture can be described or lifted to higher dimensions. Here we had flat space or half of flat space. Uh, here we had an ADS tube in appropriate coordinates so that it looked like a black hole. Similarly now what I've got in higher dimensions is a topological black hole um, where I'm just looking at ordinary ADS space in a particular coordinate system. And then I've got the bath region and instead of having flat space now I've got this particular geometry. And so in going from two dimensions to here it's a simple lift. The one difference again is the two that was pointed out by Edgar and Ilias. Um, and so I've tried to illustrate that by the two wings in my asymptotic uh, or in my uh, bath geometry here. And the difference is that the defect appears in the middle of the bath space. It's not on the boundary of a bath space, but this geometry is uh, at the, well, it's also the geometry of the boundary of my black hole is just an R cross a hyperbolic space. But again, this hyperbolic space is one dimension lower. And so that's uh, the context in which uh, I'm going to try and study these quantum extremal islands. Here, what I've done is I've unfolded uh, my hyperbolic spaces. Uh, or my boundary geometries. And so the Penrose diagram looks like the Penrose diagram of flat space. And here's a slice running through the middle, which is the defect, which has a, a dimension one lower. Um, remember that's this boundary diamond here and, and the copy for the thermophile double in the uh, bulk geometry or the gravity description. Now, 
the question we want to ask is what's the entanglement entropy of the bath as well as the uh, entropy of the thermophil double. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, or I'm going to consider some large portion of the bath which now has two sides on either side of my defect. And remember there's a times two here because I'm doing that on both sides. And so I'm going to ask what's the entropy of those large regions uh, that contain the uh, most of the bulk. And one of the things we can ask is how does that evolve in time? Well, the timelines in this picture evolve much the same as they do in uh, a Penrose diagram of Minkowski space. And so they all converge on this point in the future up here. Um, and, and so as I evolve my system forward, I'm actually asking for the entanglement entropy of these regions here. Now, if we look at the full boundary, now this is a cross section of my geometry here. The brain is the green line. There's some kind of horizon, uh, which is the dotted line across. The uh, purple lines here indicating the two copies of this, uh, or uh, slices, time slices of this uh, uh, hyperbolic geometry here. And then the Time evolution, if we ask how these things evolve in time, well, the dots move towards uh, the brain, the location of the defect or towards the, where the brain encounters the end. But that evolution might uh, set up uh, some memories of scenarios that are familiar from our usual uh, discussions of holographic entanglement entropy. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to throw away the brains for a moment. This is now just a cross section of ADS space. But we can remember that when we were considering two regions, a disconnected regions on the boundary of ADS space, there were two competing extremal surfaces, one in which, uh, well, one in which the two regions were the RT surfaces connected the ends of the two regions and one in which the two regions had disconnected uh, RT surfaces. And when the regions were small, then we had these disconnected regions. And when the regions were large or covered a considerable fraction of the boundary, then in fact, we went to these connected phase. And I've also colored in the cor uh, a time slice of the corresponding entanglement wedge just to remind you that the remarkable thing about this connected region is that in fact, uh, entanglement wedge reconstruction tells us that information stored in the boundary here can tell us about uh, bulk degrees of freedom deep into the interior of the ADS space. So the only thing I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna draw a line through those pictures because now I wanna think about exactly the same uh, scenario, um, but in the case of my brain geometry. So there's a lot of extra geometry hidden around the green line, but I again have these two classes of surfaces. And what one finds is that at early times in the, the setup that I had, these are the relevant surfaces. Um, and as time evolves, the entanglement entropy grows with time. And the entanglement wedge only tells us about these bulk regions near uh, either one of these two surfaces. And that's what I'll call the growth phase, or that's the phase where the entanglement entropy is growing. Of course, we make a transition at late times to this connected phase. At this point, the entanglement ed, uh, or the RT surfaces extend across the brain. Um, and what one finds is that, in fact, the entanglement wedge uh, allows us to talk about the degrees of freedom here on the uh, brain. And in fact, that's a representation then of our quantum extremal island. In the gravity theory on the brain, what's happened is we've produced this quantum extremal island that's uh, deep in the gravita uh, gravity region. And this is, of course, uh, the page phase, this is the phase where the entanglement entropy is fixed in time. Another way to think about this is to instead of think about the blue regions, to think about the black regions in this construction. 
in this case, um, what I can do is I, I'm, I'm calculating the entanglement entropy of these two regions, um, but, I, but that's very much like uh, the hartman maldacena construction of many years ago. In this case, I'm considering two regions on opposite sides of the black hole. And so in this growth phase, what's happening is the system is thermalizing, but very quickly what happens is the uh, entanglement entropy of those regions saturates the, the uh, uh, RT surfaces, which are crossing the horizon here, snap back, and now they're on either side of the uh, uh, black hole horizon. And, and in fact, the, uh, well, one of the features was that the system, the entanglement entropy has saturated and uh, we're in this phase over here where the entanglement entropy is just a constant. One of the points about this construction or this perspective is the fact that these uh, two surfaces intersect the brain outside the horizon is just a consequence of entanglement wedge uh, nesting. So I've been able to reproduce this story uh, in higher dimensions, uh, but what I'd really like to do is I'd like to use this uh, framework or this understanding to try and answer some questions that might've been floating around uh, at least in the early days of these uh, discussions. So some of the questions you might ask are, or, you know, one that I asked was, are the Planck brain degrees of freedom really part of the boundary theory? They seem to be part of the boundary here in this picture, or are they part of the bulk degrees of freedom? Uh, a somewhat ad hoc or apparently ad hoc prescription was, that was introduced uh, in that original paper is that the RT surfaces are allowed to end on that Planck brain. Is that uh, really something that, that we should advocate for? And related to the first question, you know, is this vast state really describing the degrees of freedom or give us information about the degrees of freedom in the quantum extremal island over here? So, of course, in our construction, the reason why I did it this way rather than having uh, the brain on the edge of something is that in our construction, the brain is explicitly in the middle of the bulk geometry. And so there's no discussion or no doubt that it is part of the bulk degrees of freedom. Similarly, there's no new rule that says RT surfaces end on the brain. Rather, what happens is that RT surfaces extend through the bulk and on occasion, depending on the situation, those RT surfaces will cross the brain. Um, I can, in this scenario, just invoke, again, entanglement wedge reconstruction in the usual way. And I expect that degrees of freedom here uh, in the boundary CFP in these two regions are going to tell me or give us information about what's happening uh, on the brain in this quantum extremal island. Of course, I can make closer contact with the original construction by make, doing a Z2 orbifold along the brain here. And in that case, now this, you know, in my picture is an edge of the diagram, but all of these statements here are uh, still going to apply. Um, and so that was the reason that I really wanted to work in the setup that I did. Some other questions about technical details, two dimensions, you know, was that important? Well, no, of course not. Uh, it, it shouldn't have been. But what I've explicitly done is give a construction in uh, any number of dimensions or higher dimensions. I'd also point out this paper where they did uh, numerical work to show that this works for a four dimensional uh, CFP and all of that was uh, set up very similar to ours. Um, a more interesting question is if we go uh, to this paper from last fall where they were uh, where they were uh, elucidating these quantum extremal islands, there were two kinds of descriptions that they talked about. There was a full quantum description and there was a semi-classical description. Um, and so, you know, do we have any insight into that? Well, I think it really goes back to these three descriptions that I talked about before. You know, the usual ADS-CFP correspondence 
says that these two descriptions are equivalent. And I would advocate that those are uh, providing a UV complete framework. And so that the description of the radiation of the bath, I mean, the boundary theory is a full quantum description in this particular case. However, in this case, I already pointed out that, um, you know, this is an effective description of the system. In particular, the theory on the uh, brain came with an intrinsic cutoff. And so beyond a certain point, we're not going to trust this description. And so I would, uh, well, I could say more there, but, but this is then the framework uh, where I see a semi-classical dis uh, or the uh, semi-classical description of the radiation that these authors talked about. Um, this is the place where I have a description that involves a piece on the boundary and this quantum extremal island in the gravity region. Um, one of the real puzzles was how is uh, information encoded? Um, you know, and here, I'll, well, this has already been said, and so I'll go very quickly. You know, the the growth phase uh, is something that we understood for a long time. The puzzle is these the saturation on the right here or the decrease on the left. Um, but we should keep in mind that these uh, growth phases really were in, understood because of smooth semi-classical saddle points that revealed that the black holes had entropy but they didn't tell us anything about the underlying microscape, microstate. And in that framework, we were led to a puzzle, uh, namely the information paradox that I described before. However, we thought that, well, to understand the second half of the page uh, curve, that we would really have to get a detailed understanding of those black hole microstates and how the information is encoded in the radiation. And so the real surprise here is that that's not the case. That in fact, again, what we're seeing are semi-classical saddle points coming to the rescue. And they're telling us about uh, the second half of the page curve or the unitary evolution, but they're not giving up uh, the details about the microscopic states that are involved. And so that's uh, somewhat of a disappointment but it's also uh, just, again, coming to this point that the uh, Euclidean path integral or the semi-classical path integral seems to know, a gravity path integral seems to know uh, a lot about uh, the unitarity in the theory. Um, so I've run over and I'm just gonna put up my uh, conclusion slide. Um, what I did is I, hope I presented a simple holographic model where I, I tried to tell you that, you know, many of these new insights about black hole evolution and the properties that we're seeing there, the new saddle points are, are really, they can be viewed in a more familiar framework, namely the framework of holographic entanglement entropy. And of course, there are many things, many questions that are still outstanding. And so I'll conclude by saying there's still lots to explore. And so at that point, I'll thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much for a very, very interesting talk. Any questions, please? We have one question. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in your model, you said that uh, uh, this uh, island contribution can be understood from this cross section, right? Of, uh, Yeah, exactly. So, uh, can you maybe uh, rephrase or understand this uh, this uh, contribution from the, like you know, these uh, proposals of, of relating the cross section in terms of uh, uh, reflected entropy or entanglement of purification? Uh, yeah. Can you can you understand the, this island contribution in terms of those quantities? No, I, uh, I, I there's something very interesting going on here, and this this picture doesn't do it justice. Um, in fact, if, if you drew this picture with the full geometry that I had uh, many, many slides ago, 
you know, a picture like this, what you would find is that these surfaces are sort of, I, I mean, they, they curve nicely, but the, the, the minimal cross section would be out here away from the brain. And because of the symmetric configuration, there would be a similar minimal surface or minimal cross section over here. On the other hand, the brain does play an interesting role in that, that there's a cross section here, but that's actually a maximal or, or a maximum in the cross section. Um, I think there's something interesting to be understood there, but the, the truth is I, 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 I really haven't uh, thought more about it. Um, but, but that's a great question and it's something uh, we're only starting to think about at least right now. Okay, thanks. Can I ask a question? More questions, please ask. Rob, you mentioned several times the existence of a cutoff, and I presume you mean ultraviolet cutoff on the brain. What is this cutoff? Uh, it's the L that appears right here in that, that action. This is really that ratio of L over this L effective is the cutoff in my uh, brain theory over the geometric scale of the brain. And L is the bulk ADS scale, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is a UV cutoff or ultraviolet cutoff? Sorry, UV versus ultraviolet? What's Sorry, UV or an IR cutoff? It's a UV cutoff, right? It's a UV cutoff, yeah. Okay. I see. It's it, it, yeah, okay, that's a tech, I, I mean, this is really the UV cutoff that you're, you're used to. It, it's just that uh, the metric that I'm working with here is the induced metric on the brain. So it's becoming, you know, distances are becoming very, very large. Usually what we do is, you know, we do a conformal transformation. So the geometry and our boundary theory is finite. Yeah. And, and we have a tiny uh, UV cutoff. Um, and so what happens is you just do the usual uh, conformal transformations. And what you find is that, you know, the cutoff that I always call delta in all of my papers uh, just becomes this L. The okay, ADS thank scale, you. The bulk ADS scale in terms of the induced metric. Thank you. Please, more questions? Uh, let me ask a small question. So uh, your geometric picture uh, seems to imply that uh, if you study more fine-grained measure of uh, uh, the information uh, structure in the radiation, such as uh, uh, mutual formation, for example, between uh, late time and early time radiation, then uh, this cross section will show exactly which parts of the islands uh, island correspond to the early time or late time radiation. Is that correct? Oh yeah, no, no, yeah. You can do more complicated. Uh, uh, I don't know what picture to point at, but but you can you can uh, look at the entanglement entropy in in more careful ways, and you can associate. Uh, different parts of the radiation with different parts of the bulk. Uh, or you can ask, where is that information encoded? What one finds is that it's encoded in a very redundant uh, way. Um, but that's, well, that's a whole talk in itself. Uh, so I, I, didn't, I didn't address any of that here. But you're right, yeah. They're, they're m far more uh, fine-grained or, or uh, 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 you know, far more detailed questions you can ask about the island and about the radiation. Yeah, so I, I guess what I want, uh, really wanted to ask is uh, whether this, uh, uh, your specific model uh, gives any more insight to these fine-grained measures uh, compared to uh, uh, original models. Um, the, well, the truth is we haven't studied that. I mean, we've only studied that uh, uh, in, in the case of the two-dimensional model. Um, I, yeah, I, well, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure if there would be qualitatively different behavior in higher dimensions. 
Um, I actually suspect that there might be. Uh, so, so that might be an interesting uh, exercise. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. More questions? Maybe I will ask a very simple question sure. because you, uh, Rob, you have a possibility to discuss any G. And we know that in some sense, um, when we consider G goes to infinity, uh, some model can simplify it. Do you, yeah. can, exp can one expect something similar here? If there are any reason try to consider your model in the large G limit? That's an interesting question. I, I've never thought about that. I, I, you know, what I suspect is that, uh, you know, certain formulas would simplify, um, but I'm not sure that, uh, you know, one of the things about the model as I presented it is it's already so simple um, that you can do most of the work analytically. Um, and, and so I'm not sure that there's going to be a real advantage in taking that limit. Um, mm -hmm. But I have to confess that I haven't thought about it uh, before. That's an interesting question. Okay, thank you very much. More questions, please? So I just had a quick question about the effective description. Yeah. So if I... I know you just flashed this for a second, but you said that you could also have put explicit terms on the brain if you wanted to. Yeah. Now, if I wanted to write down the effective description, the lower dimensional one, so is it correct that it would just be whatever the holographic CFT is that you're beginning with, plus the explicit term that you wrote down, plus these induced terms that are currently on the slide? It, would that be the theory of the CFT coupled to gravity that I'd want to compute in? I, th I think so. I mean, this, the, the only thing that happens is, I, I mean, the, yeah, I'm, well, okay, there's a whole, I, I mean, the reason one might be, uh, I'll, I'll just say the reason one might be interested in doing that is because implicitly that was done in these two dimensional constructions. That uh, JT gravity is not something that's induced by the bulk. That's a that's an explicit gravity theory that you say is supported by the brain. Right. Um, in this particular case, I'm doing something simpler. I'm just adding an Einstein-Hilbert term. Um, and what in these formulas, the net effect is that you just add, you know, one over G brain to this formula here. And so it's kind of like I have an induced contribution from the CFT and then a, a, a well, I think of it as a counter term contribution uh, that, that was just sitting there as uh, a, an intrinsic uh, contribution coming from my brain theory. Did that help? Or? Yeah, thanks. Okay. okay, more questions, please. Okay, if there is no more question, let's thank Rob once again. Thank you very much for your very instructive and very interesting talk.